Major funding for The Great American Quilt is provided by Lehman Publishing, publisher of Quilter's Newsletter Magazine, the magazine for quilt lovers. By Fairfield Processing Corporation, maker of polyfill brand products for crafting. By RJR Fashion Fabrics, where innovation is a tradition. By New Home, changing the way America sews. By Keepsake Quilting, publishers of the Keepsake Quilting Catalog, the Quilter's Wish Book. And by American School of Needlework Incorporated, publisher of books in all areas of needlework. I'm glad you're here because we're going to have fun today. We're talking about quilting. Finally, we're at that point. And quilting as in the little stitches that hold the quilt together and also quilting as that group activity that seems to bind women together. Quilts can be done the top by one person and the quilting can be done by a group of people. And there's kind of a romantic legend that has grown up about quilting groups and is still with us today. Good neighbors and ladies' aid members helped, and we soon had group quilting in each other's home, or a room in the church. Those were some of the happiest years of our lives, even when dust storms raged outside and we wondered how we could ever drive home. What memories of friendship. Getting together with friends and neighbors to quilt was an excuse to party while still getting work done. For many women, Quilting bees were the only chance they had to get out of the house and see other women, to find out what was going on in the neighborhood, and get advice on child rearing, or just getting along with a husband. Winter was often the best time to quilt, because up north at least, women couldn't be outside working in the garden and began to get cabin fever after being cooped up inside for weeks on end. You can imagine how they looked forward to that knock on the door that would bring someone's child inviting them to a quilting bee. We have had deep snow. No teams passed for over three weeks, but as soon as the drifts could be broken through, Mary Scott sent her boy Frank around to say she was going to have a quilting. Everybody turned out. Quilting bees gave women the extra hands they often needed to finish quilts on top of the regular housework. Quilting bees are the best known type of working parties held. But there were all kinds of others, from corn huskings, barn raisings, sheep shearings, to even chicken pluckings. One artist's romantic view of an apple pairing makes it seem quite the frolic, with girls throwing apple peels over their shoulders. Supposedly, the initial formed as the peel hit the floor will tell her the first letter of her true love's name. At Quilting Bee's men, who Harriet Beecher Stowe referred to as that ignorant and incapable sex which could not quilt were banned until after the work was done. Hugh drove on to the center where he and several other men stayed at the tavern until it was time to come back to the Scots for the big supper and the evening. And what suppers they had. No Weight Watchers in those groups. I took six squash pies for Mary's supper. We found on the table beefsteaks, boiled pork, sweet potatoes, coleslaw, pickled tomatoes, cucumbers, and red beets, apple butter and preserved peaches, pumpkin and apple pie with sponge cake and coffee. And can you believe that was only lunch? It's hard not to think of them kind of nodding and drooping over the quilt frame after tucking into all of that. But enough about them. How about you? Have you gotten your top ready for quilting? Well, Diana and Laura are going to show you just how to get started. I'm going to work on this section right here, Diana. And I'll take this one so we can form a grid. All right. I hope you've got your blocks all sewn together. Today we're going to show you how to layer and baste your quilts, and then we'll show you how you can put them into a hoop or into a quilting frame. This is a real special step for both, both of us because we're people like you with very busy lives and families, jobs, children, grandchildren, and so it gives us the opportunity to get together and share lots of stories. It's 
fun time, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Even this basting is pretty fun. It is. It is. It's nice to do it in a group. You can see here that I'm doing a, what I, we call a diagonal baste. Mm -hmm. Just to stick in horizontally about an inch and then pull it down about two inches and off you go. Boy, this is just quick and easy. It's real fast. Zip we bang. got these three layers here that we're putting together. Got the backing, which is pulled real taut onto, um, we have a large table here, although you might not have a table this size. You could use um, their kitchen floor. Or maybe you can go to your local quilt shop or the library or your school and use their tables. Good idea, good idea. <laughs> People have done that before. Uh, you can see here that this is the backing and we have it stretched very tight onto the surface and then of course next comes the batting and the batting that we chose is uh, cotton polyester but any type of low loft bat because we want our quilt to have a real traditional t look and we don't also want to be able to quilt very small stitches That's with it. That's right and it's so important that you use a good quality batting. You've put a lot of time and a lot of money into this so don't skip skimp at this point mm -hmm. right now. Just smooth out your top, put in some pins, and mm -hmm. then you're ready to... Can you see that I'm basting? It's going to form a six inch grid over the entire quilt. And then once you have completed the grid, you can simply release the masking tape and trim the batting layer to within about a half inch of the quilt top. And then fold the backing over onto the quilt top and just with a mm -hmm. long hand running stitch all the way around the edge. This Laura, I think you it. have a quilt mm -hmm. that's I've all got, ready to go. I've got one ready to go. Let me show you how this quilt is going to go into a hoop. I'm going to um, place the uh, smaller hoop on a flat surface. And then when I, I work with a hoop, I like to start from the center of the quilt. So I'm going to lay this right over. Isn't this adorable? Yes, <laughs> and show like them this. show them here what the edge looks like now that it's been basted around. This is the basted, and this is just a running stitch that keeps the batting from fraying off onto your clothes and, and Remember, this is very portable, so you want to mm -hmm. be able to take your quilt with you, and you don't want all this batting hanging out. But also, the edge of your quilt is very fragile. That's right. Place the larger hoop on top, and then tighten up the screw. And once it's tight, then mm. give it a little push down. You want this to be just a little bit spongy. Like it's a easy, marshmallow. easier to work with. <laughs> That's right. And the hoop is uh, a nice size for beginners. It's a 14-inch round also portable. It's also very easy to learn how to quilt with. Mm -hmm. And I like to be able to have a quilt in the frame and also one in the hoop. That's right. Shall we, shall we meet at the, at the frame over sure. here? Sure. <laughs> oh, Diana, isn't this just the best part? Oh, it is. I just can't believe <laughs> we're quilting. It's been so long. Oh. It has. <laughs> we have some quilting tools that we would like to get you started with, though. And one is the quilting line. You need to, a ruler works well on geometric shapes because you can follow the edge of it. And I'm using a silver pencil here, but my very favorite tool is this chalkner, mm. and it comes in lots of different colors, and I can just mark right on, and I've got me a line. That's great. That is good. And for the lighter, lighter colors, like you said, it comes in blue or pink or yellow. Nice tool. Mm -hmm. Let's get started with a stitch, though. Okay. We need a needle, a very small needle, a between, and I usually use like a num number nine or ten. Mm -hmm. Quilting thread. Mm -hmm. And we need to put a knot in the end. So I'm going to show you how to, oops, I need to have all my fingers covered here because <laughs> this is a wonderful <laughs> gripper. It is a gripper. It's a funny little tool, but we just tell our students, well, we call it safe quilting. It is a, a surgical finger that you can buy at your drugstore, but it's, it's a handy little tool for gripping that needle. And then, of course, your thimble on your middle finger. And now I'm ready to have a good knot in the end of my thread. And notice now, as I'm placing my knot from the quilting line, I'm a good half of an inch. And I will just rub this with my other finger and pop it through. I'm going to take a back stitch onto the first stitch and up I come. Now notice that I'm totally controlling my needle with my thimble and pushing in with your thumb and underneath I have uh, my finger underneath so that when I come down I'm up mm -hmm. and down and up 
and down and up and it's sort of a rocking motion that I'm pulling. Now see how well I can just grip and pull those mm -hmm. stitches right up there and it's just a down. Notice how I'm pushing in with my thumb. Very, very important too. Just get that stitch length just about right and I'm totally controlling everything now with these two fingers and pushing up with my hand underneath. A quick return is also very, very important. That's right. It is important. And, and don't be too concerned at this point with the length of your stitches. It's going to take some time. Uh, but if you concentrate more on keeping them even, you can be sure that in no time at all, your stitches will shorten up for you. This sort of gives just kind of a little rocking motion <laughs> as you keep going Soothing, along. Soothing, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. Relaxed. And it's a, a wonderful time when you can share this with someone else. <laughs> Do you remember the time when our friend had her husband in the hospital? Oh, I do. I do. And that was just a real special time for me because I called my friend whose husband mm -hmm. was going to have some surgery in a nearby town and she said, uh, well, Diana, if you want to help, why don't you just come over? I'm going to put up my mm. quilting frame in the motel and maybe you could come over and spend some quilting time with me. and." Several of her friends just did that, and th as the days went on, she just, uh, it was just a special activity to mm -hmm. do during a time that's very stressful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful support. And then did you know that she gave it to her husband as a Christmas gift? <laughs> yes. And he still talks about it. He tells all of his friends, he says, you can't believe how much time they put into the quilting on me. That's so cute. He's so uh, proud of her. Oh. Quilting together is just just really, really special for me. Mm -hmm. I know uh, I had a friend whose daughter was getting married and she really wanted to give a quilt for her daughter, so she didn't have time to piece it, so she just drew some quilting lines and ladies went in and out of that house and that quilt was quilted in. Is that right? Yeah, in oh. about three or four days. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love that. It really does bring us together. She's old. Now I want to show you how to end this quilting stitch. Let's just take a back stitch, come up where I, and another back stitch, and notice that I'm going to take it off in between the batting, give it a little tug, and then I'll snip it with my scissors here, and Make sure, though, that you don't leave your needle into the oh, quilting frame. Oh, no. <laughs> we found a couple of needles in quilts right. before. <laughs> right. So I have a little needle holder or my pin cushion right mm -hmm. here. Make sure the needles, that you do keep track of those. They are very small and very tiny. Mm -hmm. Sharp little things. Mm -hmm. Hasn't Alex Anderson done a wonderful job on this? Yes. Oh, for me look at quilting. all the... It oh, is. It's yeah. wonderful. Oh. Beautiful. This beautiful is the one she made in the sampler, isn't mm -hmm. it? Sampler in the sampler class. Uh huh. Oh, little cherries in the middle there. It's just an adorable quilt. Perfect for uh, Fourth of July. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think quilt makers always remember the first quilt that they ever did. It's pretty momentous to actually put in that last stitch. Am I right? Those of you who are out there who are quilt makers, can you remember that first quilt? Well, here's a quilt that's all about learning how to quilt and the frustration of pulling stitches through and trying to make them very even and regular. This is a wonderful quilt by Rumi O'Brien, who's from Middleton, Wisconsin. And these little figures who are quilting bees, she says, are pulling the stitches through and are learning and enjoying the experience of quilting. The idea for this quilt came to me when I was working on my first quilt. I knew little about the art of quilting and also had not learned to use a thimble. My quilting was more like sewing then. Sometimes my quilting progressed smoothly. Other times it was tortuous. When I thought I was progressing very well, I would look back and find some stitches that weren't pulled tight enough. I would frown at my own mistakes, and soon I caught myself making all sorts of expressions, 
depending on how the quilt was progressing. Sometimes grinning, sometimes biting my lips with determination. It was rather amusing to realize that even to myself. So I would run to a mirror to look at the expressions many times. Then I realized that this is what all quilters go through and thought it would be fun if I put all these expressions on quilters' faces at various stages of quilt making in one large quilt. Rumi, I bet you're smiling all the time now when you're quilting because I can see your stitches and you may have gone through a lot when you were learning how, but you can really do it now. Sometimes Rumi spends about 10 hours quilting, so if you're a beginner, be a little patient with yourself. It will take time, but you'll get the hang of it, and it can be really fun just learning how to do it. Here's another quilt about quilting. It's about a quilt group that quilted together in Green Bay, Wisconsin for 50 years, believe it or not. This group was the Ladies' Aid quilt group, and the woman in the center of this is the maker's grandmother. The woman in the center is Edith Nickel, and her granddaughter, Frances Ginocchio, is the quilt maker of this quilt. Frances lives in Wisconsin Rapids, and she had an old brownie photograph that her mother had taken of this quilting group, and she wanted to kind of pay tribute to all the quilt makers who have quilted for years down in church basements raising money. So we looked at this quilt that is all full of wonderful 30s fabrics, and we can hear one of these quilt makers, Jean Temple, tell us a little bit about just what it was like. Dear Francie, I'm trying to put myself into a time warp to forget today and go back to the sights and sounds of 50 years ago. There was a room off the sanctuary of the Methodist Church, and we quilted there when the weather was nice. The only drawback to meeting there was that the pastor went through it from his office to the parsonage, and sometimes the ladies' conversation was a little personal. They solved that by asking him to whistle as he was approaching the door. The Quilters was a select group of the ladies' aid headed by Mrs. Clough. She only had partial vision but could easily spot a too long stitch or one out of line. We quilted for other people and were being paid, so such errors could not be allowed and the careless woman would have to take out her work and do it over. Mrs. Clough was part Indian and was very proud that her grandmother was Queen Marinette, for whom the city of Marinette was named. Her husband worked on the Chicago Northwestern Railroad and his run took him to Milwaukee. We depended on him to buy needles for us, small, fine needles so we could make small stitches. Any other needles my mother called toad stabbers. Monday afternoon, Miss Sisson would help Mrs. Clough put on the quilt. Tuesday morning, some of us were there with our lunches by nine o'clock, ready for a day's work. Some of the ladies liked to talk and found it impossible to continue quilting while telling a story mother thought she had come to work not to tell stories. I remember Mrs. Jessen as being slow moving and slow of speech and rather dramatic in her storytelling. Too bad I can't remember the story, but all I can remember is the ending, told very dramatically and a little breathlessly. And when the little dears were born, they didn't have any eyes. The talk would be about the quilt we were on, maybe one we had done we liked especially well, or one that was so hard to do, what bat was best, and the quilt pattern hard or easy to quilt. Church affairs always came in for discussion, but no roast of the preacher was allowed. They discussed the quilters not present and the reasons why they weren't. I don't know what they did when my mother wasn't there, but when she was, no dirty stories. Mother was straight-laced. At noon, we gathered in the kitchen and shared our lunches. Mrs. Clough made tea, and Mrs. Benton told fortunes from the tea leaves. Then back to work. What a joy to take the quilt off the frames and see the beautiful entirety, and then turn it over 
and see the pattern even more predominantly stitched on the plain white back. Week after week, we followed the same procedure. If we didn't quilt for someone else, a quilter usually had a top waiting for the frames. Hope this gives you a little feel of what it was like 50 years ago. Wasn't that a wonderful letter? That was Jean Temple, and she's written me some warm letters, too. And one of the things that she did was to save the quilting, uh, quilting stencils that Edith Nichol had. If any of you in your family find pieces of cardboard like this, these are quilting stencils. And they tell so much about the time period in which women were using these and hand making them. So don't throw them out if you ever find anything like this. Look at how this is pinned together. And there's one here that's even sewn together. This really shows they were making do. And it was really recycling before there was even a word for recycling because they didn't need it. Now, along with these quilting stencils, of Mrs. Nickel, we have some quilts that are quilted by Mrs. Picard, who was in that quilting group. These are both her quilts. Actually, Jean Temple quilted this one. And I thought these were such great 1930s examples that I wanted Rod to tell you a little bit more about them, because these are the type of quilts you're very likely to have from your family. This was. The quilting group I told you about? Oh, the, yes. One of the women oh. in this group did these quilts, and oh, I think oh, they're great. really oh, I love tulip quilts. Women love flowers, and they love them in their quilts. And they've, they've been in quilts from the 18th century up mm -hmm. through the 20th century, like this one. And when you see them in, I think this is probably from the 30s or the 40s. I think this was a pattern. I do. So many um, patterns were published in newspapers, or yeah. they could send away for them. A lot of times in the newspapers, they would have a different flower each week That's right. that they would make. Um, so someone could have taken one and just duplicated it. I know there's that Marie Webster windblown tulip, too, right. that's similar to this. Right. This green really catches my eye. Is there a name for that? It's called Nile Green. Uh -huh. It's in the, the fabric swatch books from the, from the printers, and, and that's a real identifying clue from, for quilts that of this period. period. You see it lots in the grandmother's flower garden and double wedding rings. Mm -hmm. 30s, 40s, and 50s? And 50s, oh yes, yeah. They continued to make this type of quilt on up into the 50s. But they're even making this type still today, which yeah. you see quilting yeah. groups working on. You were telling me about sleeping under a... The first quilt I ever bought had flowers on them. It was an uh -huh. 1880s quilt, and it was the first quilt I slept under. So slept it's just, under one last night, my grandmother's too. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, a tulip quilt. I was looking at some of the fabrics inside here that are really beautiful. A lot of these probably, again, sacking material fabrics mm -hmm. and just little prints that a lot of them were based on early 19th century. These look like century. little dresses that I used to wear. Yes. From now, way back when. <laughs> Again, women would, would use the fabrics that were special to them mm -hmm. and put them into their quilts. I love this. We've been talking a lot about memories today. And one of the drawings that I've seen that has quilters in it was by the artist David Sherman. It was his memory of his grandmother. I love the drawing, so I asked him a little bit about it, because you know how you always think of quilt makers as being just little old ladies? Well, his grandmother had a pet alligator, which she kept, and she liked to put it to sleep. And you know how she did it? She used to rub its stomach. So who says quilt makers don't have fun? But best of all, he remembered his grandmother as a quilt maker. We've had a number of patchwork quilts over the years. Uh, some of which have been eaten by Mitz the dog. Fortunately, Mitz has left my grandmother's quilt alone, which we've had for over 20 or 30 years. My grandmother used to make these quilts while she sat in her bedroom, and the quilting frame was so large that it stretched over her bed like a canopy. She would sit beside the bed and make these quilts for hours each day. Later on, when she got sick, she would sit in bed like Matisse and sew on the design. I often felt that there must have been very strange 
things going on in her head to be able to sit there all day long and do that. She just couldn't become a blank. So when I did this drawing, I invented a, some visions for her, but when she turned her head to look, they weren't there. When people say they just don't make quilts like they used to, I like to show them the work of Pam Studs to La Pipe Creek, Texas. Pam works with pieces so tiny that they're like the old quilts with squares so small they were called postage stamp quilts. Pam's quilts, which are hand quilted by her mother Betty Studstill, bridge the gap between yesterday and today. They have the dense overall patterning found on some old quilts, yet she's painting all the patterning on the fabric by hand, a definitely modern touch. We've been talking about the quilting stitch today. And you know, I think a lot of quilt makers really see making quilts as a way of making a mark that will stay even after they're gone. You know how dishes, you do them and they need doing again the next day and you're vacuuming and you look and the floor seems to need vacuuming immediately again. Well, with quilts, quilts stay even after you're gone, hopefully to be with loved ones and to remind them of you. So I hope in our talks about quilt making that we've given you more ideas that you can use in your own work. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I know we have. I hope we've also given you some new appreciation for the great American quilt. <laughs>